Oh, great pleasure to have Professor Richard Rika uh, to be our first lecturer. Uh, Rika 教授呢，他是在剑桥大学三一学院获得了数学硕士和博士，现在是意大利米兰比科塔大学的教授。So Professor Rika, he received his master and doctoral degrees in mathematics from Trinity College, Cambridge University. Uh, he is now a professor of the University of Milan Bicocca in Italy. His main research focus is on quantum theory, including the quantum theory of the quantum field. His main research direction is topological hydrodynamics, including topological hydrodynamics, and the quantum field. His main research direction is topological hydrodynamics, including topological entertainment in vortex dynamics, and so on. He is one of the leading scientists in the field of quantum theory. 发表 S N 论文八十余篇，包括唯一作者的 Nature 以及 Mars 等著名的期刊作品。呃、uh, ，He has published so many、uh, important、uh, research papers,、uh, including a soul of a nature paper and four epic、uh, monographs,、uh, with over two thousand citations. His ASH index is twenty four. 呃，他呢从长期担任剑桥大学应用数学和理论体系 （MTP） 还有伦敦大学学院 （UCL）、呃、Mr. Brown 研究院、呃、IAS Institute for Advanced Study， 还有巴黎高师等呃单位的呃呃客座教授，还有那个副座研究员等等，呃，学术声誉卓著。呃，他同时呢也是呃 Springer。呃、uh, ，World Scientific， 还有帝国理工等呃著名是呃学术出版集团的专注类的指导人。好，那么呃更多的内容呢，我就不再不再念了，因为内容太多了啊。那么今天呢，他将呃给一个呃研究生的短课程，一个四个学时的短课程，呃标题叫做 Riemann Topology and Physics， 呃。那么这个 abstract 呢，就由就由呃，跟着自己来给大家嗯。嗯，好，现在呃 ，is your turn。Well, thank you, thank you, Professor Liu, for this kind invitation. And uh, okay, I will uh, follow the title to some extent, uh, not exactly uh, word by word. Uh, the title. Okay. Is uh, as he said, uh, Riemann uh, topology and physics, and this is actually uh, a tribute to an old friend who passed away uh, unexpectedly in uh, 2015. And he published a book with this title, and uh, his uh, name is uh, Michael Monastiski. Actually, with a Y here. Um, I think this is Bierkoiser. Um Publishing House. And the first edition was probably 94, maybe. And second edition is, uh, uh, second edition is 2008. So I encourage you to go to this book for uh, a beautiful uh, presentation of uh, Freeman's life and applications of uh, his ideas in uh, Topological field theory, if you like, or physical uh, context. I will uh, actually, the title of my lecture will be more modest than this one, and uh, so I will focus on Riemann and uh, Riemann's uh, cuts in uh, topological uh, field theory. Uh, giving just uh, some simple examples of the application of this technique that was invented by Riemann 
to tackle completely different problems. He wasn't thinking of uh, mathematical physics at all. He was uh, thinking, actually that was the work of his uh, thesis, of uh, finding a way to study the continuity of uh, uh, functions of a complex variable. Functions of complex variable like, uh, you know, square root of z, if you look at solutions, you know that uh, these uh, solutions have two branches. And if you look for solutions of the logarithm of uh, z uh, being a complex variable, then you have infinitely many branches. So in order to tackle uh, this problem of, uh, how to say, kind of reducing the study in terms of continuity of a function that has uh, many branches to a function that is well defined on one, uh, on one, uh, now we would say manifold only, we, or he, introduced the concept of cuts. And uh, through a cut, then a Riemann sheets, etc., etc. I won't discuss this, but I will use a paper, a fundamental paper by Riemann, to show you that uh, by interpreting um, using, for example, fluid mechanics, using simple ideas well known at the time in fluid mechanics, you can follow that paper of Riemann. That paper is only five pages long and it contains very simple equations, maybe two equations. So I invite you to read uh, or try to read uh, the English translation of this uh, paper is totally readable for a master student. Uh, so let me quote uh, this paper. It is by Bernard Riemann. Um, okay, the English translation would uh, be a proposition, propositions on what at the time was called analysis situs. Uh, this is uh, this is the way, at the time, that people refer to topology, geometry of geometry of position, if you like. That uh, word, that analysis uh, situs, um, was substituted uh, by topology uh, by the work of uh, Listing. Listing was a student of Gauss. He introduced the word topology, and Riemann was. Uh, uh, at the same time there, at the University of Göttingen, let me give you the exact uh, reference for this uh, paper. This is the Journal of uh, Mathematique. It is in German, this paper, but you find English translation. And this is volume 54, and is 1857. As I said, this paper, it's totally readable, very simple for anybody who is uh, uh, just uh, knowing some basic math and physics. And uh, it contains the idea of uh, cuts. So I will use this paper, nothing else, to introduce the idea of cuts, just remembering that actually he was thinking of something else. He was thinking of uh, uh, the holomorphic um, aspect or analyticity aspects of uh, functions of complex variables. But we won't talk about functions of complex variables at all. We just use this paper. Another information is that most of the material I present you today is now published as a chapter in a book. So I will uh, address your attention to another book, and this is uh, uh, a noted. Uh, Fields, uh, the title, and uh, is um, edited, or if you like, uh, uh, by myself and uh, Professor Liu. And is a Springer. 
Stranger Nature book published this year. So if you go to this book and you look for uh, for um, for a chapter that we worked on on uh, um, on uh, Riemann, so you find the material I'm going to present you. So just a brief word on topology, just to set the scene. Well, topology, as uh, I told you, was introduced uh, by uh, a number of very important mathematicians. We have uh, origins of topology can be looked at uh, the work of uh, maybe something like uh, done by Leibniz at a certain point on uh, characteristics of um, aspects of geometry. And then um, Euler, of course, contributed with his uh, famous uh, formula, the Euler's characteristic, uh, studying polyhedra, and then the Königsberg uh, bridge problem. So this was just instances of the beginning of topology. The, the first word uh, topology appeared in listing book, and the listing booklet is a short uh, um, book. Um, um, uh, actually, was about the Möbius strip. So what we call Möbius strip is actually an idea investigated uh, by listings. We should call it listings uh, band or. Um, of course, Gauss, Listing was a student of Gauss, and Gauss was very keen on topology, and Gauss, uh, among so many things he did, he also introduced the concept of linking number between one curve and another in space. So, um, this is uh, uh, related to uh, knot theory, if you like, the study of knots and links, and uh, is clearly fundamental in the modern world of uh, knotted fields uh, research. Uh, Riemann was not technically speaking a student of Gauss, but attended uh, lectures by Gauss, and he was extremely bright, and uh, at a very young age, um, uh, he was born in 1826, by 1851, he was uh, almost ready with uh, what we may call a uh, thesis, a PhD thesis. And then um, in '54, he was finally published and discussed openly. And Gauss uh, was very keen to push, or better, to chair the selection committee uh, for a new professorship, and that was given to Riemann at a very young age. So Riemann uh, um, became professor in Göttingen, the same place where uh, Gauss was, and Helmholtz, and many other important people. But he wasn't, uh, the work of Riemann uh, wasn't uh, recognized as so fundamentally important in the following years. Only, let's say, with, uh, with Einstein's relativity, etc., etc., um, work on Riemannian geometry became important, and uh, of course in the pure mathematics as well. Um, all right, so I said that these are the references. I will, uh, as I said, refer to this paper, five pages, as I said. So let me let me start uh, to tell you something about this, and we'll keep it extremely simple. All right. So the basic idea is I will follow exactly. The paper by Riemann, okay, so as he says, uh, he considered a two dimensional region, something like this, maybe with a boundary, and uh, we call it R, this region, and uh, for the moment, imagine that we think of uh, 2D, okay, so it's a 2D region, and in this 2D region, we think of the uh, functions uh, saying U, and uh, this is a function of X and Y. And uh, v as a function of x and y. Uh, why I chose a new little u and, and little v, I tell you immediately, is not in Riemann, but I told you I want to establish a link with uh, some uh, simple things, for example, hydrodynamics. So if you think of these two functions as uh, 
part of a velocity field U, then you think of U as two components, U and V. Okay? So imagine there is a fluid here. It's not mentioned in Riemann's paper, but this is one way to figure out what we are doing. And uh, then uh, we assume, assume that uh, we consider the differential and we take uh, u dx plus uh, v dy and we take uh, this as uh, written in terms of a potential d phi uh, dx plus uh, d phi dy in dy and we assume that this is an exact form okay so assume uh, d phi is uh, exact um, or better phi is exact um, okay um, now we can take uh, the following dx uh, dx uh, uh, dv let me say dv dx uh, because of v is defined as d phi y d phi dy in uh, dx we take uh, dx here d dx d phi dy plus uh, we have the other contribution we just uh, swap uh, this we have a d dy of uh, d phi dx we just swap uh, the uh, derivatives and uh, d phi dx uh, is in terms of u, so we have a d dy of uh, u. So dv dx is equal to du dy, so we have uh, the dv dx uh, minus du dy is equal to zero. This is elementary. Now, we stop here for a moment, and I encourage you to jump to 3D for one moment, think of u now of uh, three terms, then you recognize that this is one component of the curl, of the curl operator. So the curl of u in 3D would be zero, if we were translating this into 3D. We stick to 2D for the moment. Okay, so uh, what does it mean this? Well, it means that uh, from uh, there, we have that uh, the integral over any closed uh, curve like this in C0, a curve in C0 is just u dx plus v dy, and this is uh, the integral to the region of uh, dv uh, dx minus du dy and this is in dx dy and because this is zero this is zero what does it mean well i guess you know very well what it means let me rewrite this uh, you know we can uh, use uh, by the way i use the phi 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 being being uh, the so-called potential of you. The, the, the term potential, potential is a scalar field, comes from Helmholtz. Okay, so we, we know we can express u as a graph of phi. Okay, and this is pretty standard. And uh, if we consider uh, going from one point to the other, suppose uh, we are in this region and we want to go from a point P to a point Q. Um, then uh, what we do, we take the integral from P to Q, and this is uh, just the integral from P to Q of uh, D phi. Okay, we can define this as uh, the uh, integral of the graph phi, uh, along this uh, line, along this line, dl being an elementary contribution, uh, along this path, and um, 
and uh, evidently by using the gradient theorem, uh, this is just uh, the difference between phi in uh, Q and uh, phi in uh, P. Okay, so evidently, if uh, if um, P uh, coincides with Q and uh, are in a closed loop uh, C zero, so if this is a path that closes on itself, uh, then evidently all this is zero. So we have that uh, um, the integral of uh, d phi over a closed loop uh, C zero is uh, uh, given by the integral along C zero of the u dl. And you recognize that this is uh, zero from there, and this is just circulation. So this is just uh, the circulation gamma along C zero, circulation. Okay, so the circulation, if we deal with an exact uh, differential, an exact form, the circulation is zero in a domain R. That's it. Okay? We know all this pretty well because we deal, you know, remember, very often you deal with conservative forces. So if instead of U being a velocity, U is a force, a vector field, a vector force that you can express in terms of the gradient of the function. So it's a conservative force. The conservative force is, uh, has this uh, property, okay? Its circulation is zero. All this is uh, standard uh, and, uh, and well known. Now I assumed, uh, I didn't say much, I assumed that uh, this is my domain in 2D and this is a loop in uh, this domain. I didn't say anything, so you Assume as well from the drawing that you can reduce this uh, always to zero, to a point. Okay, so we have two facts now. First fact is from the drawing that there is no obstruction to reduce this loop. You can take the loop as small, as large as you wish, and you can always reduce the, uh, uh, the loop, if you like, to a single point. And this is consistent with the fact that the circulation is zero. The other fact is that the circulation is zero. So, that's okay, no problem. You reduce the loop uh, to a point, evidently the contribution to the integral is zero, and this is consistent with the fact that because your uh, form was exact, you knew already that the circulation is zero. Now, the problem is, uh, what about uh, if I have uh, an obstruction, an obstruction. So uh, suppose, suppose uh, now that uh, we have uh, the domain R, same R, same to D, but uh, there is an obstruction here. Okay? Well, what does it mean an obstruction? Well, an obstruction means that any loop like this, C0, can be shrunk to a point, a point, if it does not embrace the obstruction. Because if it embraces the obstruction, if it encircles the obstruction, then it cannot, say C1, it cannot be reduced to a point. It can be reduced to the boundary of this obstruction only. So, we have a problem. Circulation is no longer zero, not because uh, this domain, um, in this domain, the loop cannot be shrunk, it can be shrunk to zero, but because of the, uh, the presence of the obstruction. The obstruction impedes the, the loop to uh, get to zero, to a point. Okay, so how do we tackle this problem? Well, first of all, let me use in a very simple words um, to some terminology here. So if, uh, let's say, we have two situations. If uh, C0 is uh, reducible, always, whatever, for any, any C0 
in uh, in D in this R letter. Um, if uh, C0 is reducible to a point, say to a point, for any given C0, then uh, our domain R is uh, said to be simply connected. Or simply connect. Okay? This is the first case. Second case is if we have an obstruction. The second case there uh, is uh, uh, if there exists at least one C, at least one loop uh, that uh, has uh, circulation gamma different from zero, it is, uh, it is uh, not reducible to a point, uh, then we have that R is uh, uh, said to be uh, multiply connected. Multiply connected. Because of the presence of the obstruction. Okay? So this is just the idea. We have, uh, we have a domain that either is simply connected or is multiply connected. Now, of course, we may have uh, one hole like this, or an obstruction, or two obstructions, or three obstructions, many obstructions. You know, we may have uh, an obstruction here, an obstruction there, etc., etc. Three obstructions of many obstructions. So we have a different type of uh, topological complexity. Topological meaning uh, you can go from one situation to another by continuous deformation. And in this case, you cannot go. There is no way to go from one case to another by continuous deformation. Because the number of obstructions increasing means that you cannot deform two obstructions and three obstructions, etc., etc. You can only do that by splitting one obstruction into two, but this is not allowed in uh, continuous deformations. Okay, all right. So let's uh, let's summarize a little bit what uh, we've done so far. So we have uh, in summary. I go back. Uh, I go back to the to the statements before. And if U is uh, conservative, is uh, conservative, um, i.e., if uh, U can be written as the graph of a phi, as we were doing before, then the curl of uh, U is uh, equal to zero, curl of u is equal to zero, regardless, regardless of the, uh, let's say, connectivity, regardless of the connectivity, connectivity of the ambient space of definition, of the domain of definition, of definition. When uh, when I when I wrote this, I interpret the circulation in terms of Stokes theory. The circulation circulation can be written as well here as uh, the integral of the curl of u, curl of uh, u in terms uh, of the surfaces and by, by 
Okay, curl of U in terms of uh, this is a vector, curl of U um, through the surface Vs. Okay, this is Stokes. Stokes. Stokes uh, theorem. And, uh, and of course, we knew that this is zero because I told you before when we had the two dimensional case, I, I told you, remember, this can be interpreted as one component of the curve. Okay? All right. So this is the case. This is first case. The second case is uh, if u is irrotational. Irrotational is irrotational, i.e., if uh, we have the curl of u equal to zero, then uh, u u equal to grad phi only if the uh, domain of definition is uh, uh, simply correct. Okay, so these are the two fundamental, the two fundamental facts that uh, has to have to be kept in mind. All right, now. I told you Riemann was interested in the finding a way to determine a way to determine the continuity of a function. If uh, if uh, the function, if the domain of the definition is multiply connected, then phi, that now we call the potential of u, is multivalued. Multivalued as multiple values at one point. How can you see this intuitively? Well, it's very simple. You take, you take uh, your obstruction, let me call it gravity. I move away from the idea of an obstruction and I uh, invite you to think of a hole, okay? Imagine that this is a hole, this is our domain of definition, and uh, suppose you reduce your C1, your loop uh, C1 around this hole. Okay, now of course you can rescale your computation, your integral around the hole, so that coincides with an angle. Because imagine that this is a perfect circle, for example, radius equal to one, you just integrate over the angle. And the angle that you integrate goes from zero to two pi, but then it keeps going. It keeps going. Two pi, four pi, six pi, etc., etc., etc. A multiple number of pi. So how do you fix that? How do you fix the number of rotation around this? Is uh, arbitrary. So this uh, uh, one way or another, we are led to this idea that is so simple and is quite remarkable. And you take your domain of definition, say R, with uh, your your hole in it, like this. And then you insert, you insert a cut. Let me let me use uh, colors for this. You insert a cut here. Okay. This is a cut. This is a cut. Cut in uh, R. And now you imagine, you don't do it, but you may imagine to open up this cut on this, uh, on the cut of this domain R. So imagine you have your, your hole there, and then you do something like this. It's imaginary, okay? You don't do it in practice, but it's like thinking like this. If you think like this, this is just, then what you notice, and here we move towards mathematical physics, 
you notice that the boundary, the boundary of our domain has changed. So let me denote the cut with the letter Q. And now the new boundary, uh, so let's say the new boundary of R prime, and this is uh, uh, the boundary of R. Now the new boundary has uh, these uh, two, let's say two, two cuts or two contributions to the boundary. Q, let's say minus, and uh, let's say Q plus. So the new boundary is made by the old boundary, let me write it here, dr, and uh, so we say, we say that this is uh, uh, the boundary, boundary, and uh, this is dr prime, and dr prime is the, bound, the old boundary, plus, if you like a union, uh, the two cuts, the contribution. The contribution, let me call this a sigma, so a sigma on, I don't know if I use a sigma or some letter, to denote uh, this new boundary. Uh, I will uh, use a sigma later, but let me use Q. So uh, Q uh, minus union Q plus. So you see the boundary has changed. Okay, uh, all right, uh, we have definitions. We have uh, several definitions in Riemann's paper for what is a multiply connected surface uh, in the presence of a number of uh, holes or obstructions. We would, uh, there are two holes here, so we would call it a doubly connected uh, region and there is a triply connected region. I stick to the old terminology of uh, Riemann so that it is easy to identify the number of obstructions, the number of holes with the adverb we use to identify the connectivity. So triply connected, it means it has uh, three holes, so to speak. If you want to simplify this, as we did for one hole, you see now, now any, any circuit that you, you take C0, that we take in this new, in this uh, new region with a cut, can be shown to a point. Because this, if this is a hole, then you see what happens. Okay? This is what happens. This is what happens. And so, okay, so we can reduce this to a simply connected region because we can deform it and uh, this can be reduced. Uh, this can be reduced to this. And any circuit here can be shown to a point. So, this is the idea, right? So, one hole, one hole, one cut. Now, here we have two holes. So the idea is, okay, let's insert a cup here and another cup here. And uh, this opens up, let me, let me emphasize, let me emphasize this in this fashion. Okay, this uh, opens up like this, if you like, with a hole here. And uh, there is another cup over there. So let me emphasize this like, uh, like this. We go like this, we go like this, and we open up this into this. And you see, you can stretch it out like this, you can stretch it out like that, and you can reduce it to simply connect it again. And similarly here. Okay, so this can be done like this, this can be done like this, etc. etc. So we can open up. Uh, uh, this, if you like, and emphasize the fact that this is uh, this is now simply connected. So very easy. You count the number of holes. You count the number of holes. You have the cuts. Let me remove this, this, and this. Okay. So you see. Very nice. 
Basically, Riemann's paper, the one I mentioned there, of uh, uh, 57, stopped here. He shows the cuts, he shows the open, everything that I drew is almost identical to what he did. You find these pictures in his paper. So, okay. Now, the starting point, remember, was that formula that resembled uh, the first component of the curve. That was the first formula we started, or actually the exact uh, definition of the potential, but then that was the formula. You find that formula in his paper. Now, this paper was published in 57, and he had in uh, December 57. And in January 58, we have uh, in the same journal, we have the publication of a very important paper by Helmholtz. Helmholtz's uh, paper on the laws, the fundamental laws of vortex dynamics. Vortex dynamics meaning that uh, uh, he essentially uh, dealt with a concentrated vorticity. What is concentrated vorticity? Well, if u is the velocity, vorticity, vorticity is defined as the curl of u. Curl of u. Okay, we call it omega. This is vorticity. And uh, the first component of the curl of u is uh, the first component of the curl of u is exactly the difference in uh, terms of partial derivatives we saw at the very beginning. So the two papers start from the same assumption. One said, what about if I have, uh, say, curl of uh, u uh, present in my domain? If it is zero, something. If it is not zero, something else. Helmholtz, same thing. He said, what are the consequences of assuming the curl of u different from zero? The two, one uh, Riemann very young, Helmholtz not so young anymore, the two used to meet at lunchtime in the same university. So at a certain point, uh, Helmholtz posed the question of curl of u different from zero to, uh, to Riemann. And Riemann probably asked himself, uh, what is uh, the problem if I consider a multiply connected domain? If I have a multiply connected domain, the potential phi in multiply connected domain um, is uh, not uniquely defined. So I have a problem in uh, dealing with multivalued functions. Multivalued functions was the topic, remember, of Riemann for functions of complex variable, but that was his topic. So very interesting to see these two papers coming, germinating from the same idea, curl either zero or different from zero. Okay, now let's stick to fluid mechanics and see the consequences of Riemann. Now, uh, consequences are the following. Uh, more or less, uh, we have to jump uh, a number of years. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, let's say, leading to uh, fundamental, fundamental uh, laws of vortex motion by by Helmholtz. This is another story. And this, uh, as I said, the same journal, 1858. Same journal, just, uh, it's not one year later, it's one month later. Okay, uh, now let's go back to fluid mechanics and see the implications of this. So what we have now, we have, first of all, in a multiple connected domain, we have a way to reduce the multiple connected domain with cuts. Yeah, that's okay, that was written there. But something new, I told you. Something that went kind of unnoticed in terms of pure mathematics. What went unnoticed is that when we perform this cut, when we perform the cut, 
We have a new boundary. A new boundary. Oh, okay, a new boundary. <laughs> but for mathematical physics, this is an interesting thing because for mathematical physics, so often, or if you like mathematics, so often we convert a volume interval to a surface interval. And the same thing happened for Stokes. We convert a, a, a surface interval from Stokes to a line interval. We go from one dimension to another dimension of the domain of definition. So if you change the boundary, we have to take account this change of boundary in the integration. Okay, so Riemann's work went on. As I said, properties of uh, morphic functions, uh, contact variables, blah, blah, blah. In uh, fluid dynamics, uh, mm, nothing happened for a while. Um, Helmholtz, Helmholtz in his paper, uh, mentioned, I think was really a footnote in the first page, uh, he pointed out the remark of Riemann. He pointed out, we take a simply connected region. After a few years, uh, came Kelvin. At a certain point, uh, Kelvin developed, uh, developed or proposed a vortex atom uh, uh, theory to uh, investigate the fundamental aspects of, uh, of, uh, of nature. This vortex atom theory uh, is a kind of anti-literum, a kind of theory of everything of today in high energy physics. Uh, when uh, we talk about uh, strings in high energy physics. And I tell you what was his idea in a very simple few words. In a very simple words, uh, we can say that imagine that we go to the microcosm, so very small scale, microscopic scale, and in this scale, imagine that we consider a vortex ring, a vortex ring. So imagine that there is a vorticity spiraling around this, and, uh, okay, like this, for example, and uh, this is a vortex. And this vortex ring uh, has a slope ring, etc., was thought to be a fundamental uh, atom in, uh, in a microcosm. And uh, the surrounding fluid, uh, the surrounding fluid was uh, considered uh, existing with uh, some properties being elastic, etc., etc., but was uh, like an ideal fluid of uh, fluid mechanics. Ideal, no viscosity, no viscosity, incompressible, perfectly elastic, and uh, the vortex uh, was living in this, uh, in this uh, fluid. This had a name, was called uh, ether. Ether as uh, an ideal, ideal, incompressible. Um, invisible, no viscosity, uh, fluid. Okay? So, there's an annoying annoying of fluid. Okay? Fluid motion was known from Euler's equation. So, Kelvin, Kelvin imagined that the fundamental atom could be, for example, a vortex ring, and because uh, of uh, Helmholtz, because of Helmholtz, uh, fundamental laws of vortex motion that stated stated that uh, for an Euler fluid, vortex uh, structures, a vortex ring, for example, was uh, an entity that could not uh, dissipate because there are no no dissipation in this. So vorticity stayed there forever. You give a vorticity, you prescribe vorticity in the form of a vortex tube or a vortex field, it stays there forever. 
So because of this result, uh, Kelvin could develop his vortex sample theory. And uh, we have uh, first paper 68, and then other papers came, other papers came, uh, 69 and 70, etc. Um, so he could rely on these results. These were rigorous results in mathematical terms. So I said, ah, if I have these results, then I can have a mathematical uh, foundation for the permanence of uh, whatever we call particles in nature. A particle uh, in a microcosm, invisible, very small scale, which is made of a vortex ring, it will stay as a vortex ring forever. Now, a vortex ring is a nice idea. What about the, what about the two vortex ring, link, rings linked together like this? If one is permanent, the two are also permanent because of this. They are embedded in the same fluid. So you can have a, a different uh, energy scale with respect to this one. So maybe this one, the vortex ring, represents the most fundamental atom, and the two vortex rings linked together. Maybe uh, an atom that is more complex, and then three, and then four, and then maybe they are knotted, and so on. So this is the idea of Kelly, to use topology, not and knots and links, to determine the spectrum, the fundamental energy spectrum of particles. It's an amazing, amazing idea, and a very, very ingenious way to uh, try to uh, mathematize, to give a model, mathematical model, for the uh, quantized spectrum of energy, which was already known from chemist uh, experiments. So this is the idea of Kelvin, okay? Right. Problem is, follow me. Suppose that uh, with your imagination, you remove the vorticity from your box. So what you are left with? You are left with an empty ring. If you remove the vorticity from uh, your box, and uh, there is a vortex link like this, then you are left with empty tubes that are embedded in the fluid. And these empty tubes represent the holes for the fluid domain. So I just uh, put uh, some chalk here, just to emphasize, these are like uh, our vortex uh, contribution, okay, vorticity here, 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 etc., all around, and vorticity goes in one, say, like this, and maybe like this, so there is a flow around them, etc., etc., and now you remove them, you remove them. So now let me take, let me go back to this vortex ring and take and take a cross section. I take a cross section, for example, something like this, like this, like this, like this. If I take a cross section of this, of uh, my cubic box, uh, I have two holes because I took I took the vorticity out and I look at the fluid here in this region of the of the plane. And these are the holes. And these are the holes. So the problem is uh, huh, but maybe I have a problem with the potential. With the potential, because the potential is uh, multivalued. Is multivalued because uh, it's not uniquely defined. We can find uh, uh, loops around these two holes uh, that do not shrink to zero. They are uh, uh, different from zero because I, the hole prevents for the obstruction, as we used to say, it prevents further shrinking. Is that clear? Okay, so now we leave the vortex atom theory behind us. We leave Riemann's technique behind us 
and helmets behind us, and let's focus on the problem of finding, fixing this difficulty. Isn't Kelvin? Isn't Kelvin? Kelvin, that, that is this problem. So, okay, let's go back to this problem. I will call it a case a study, so let me call it the Kelvin, Kelvin's uh, case study. Okay? Now the Kelvin's case study, let's let's uh, let's uh, let's consider one hole only. One hole. And uh, when I say one hole, I'm thinking, imagine a better drawing that I try now. Imagine that we have here a piece of an infinitely long vortex. Okay, so this is a vortex. A vorticity is set from here. This is a vortex, it's like a cylinder. A cylinder. And I want to understand this. In the cross section, in the cross section, uh, remember this is, uh, uh, we have uh, this image. One hole. Okay, one hole. So he read, uh, he read uh, Riemann, and uh, especially because of the footnote of Helmholtz. That's why he read, uh, he wanted to understand Riemann's better. Not because of uh, Riemann's work, because I told you Riemann's work was not in fluid mechanics, but because of this footnote of Helmholtz. Ah, what happens then if we have a vortex we remove the vorticity, so now this becomes uh, this becomes empty. So that you have nothing, nothing in this in this tube, and uh, okay, nothing in this tube. And outside, and outside in the volume, we have uh, of course a fluid, fluid that goes around, fluid that you. Now, if I take the cross section. Because I assume that this tube is infinitely long, is infinitely long, then uh, I can consider a cross section. Any cross section would do, and the fluid would be like this, and then we are back to the two dimensional case I consider in Riemann's uh, approach. So we have a fluid U that uh, is uh, flowing around. Remember the properties, the properties of this fluid. We assume that this fluid is irrotational because outside here there is no rotation. All the rotation is in the tube. So you, you, first of all, no friction. Ideal. Ideal. Ideal meaning uh, invisible. Invisible. Uh, then uh, we said irritation, irritation. Okay. And then uh, we want uh, U to be expressed in terms of a potential. All right. So we take a potential. I just want to uh, move away from Riemann. So I take a potential. I choose another letter, same sign. Okay, another sign. And let's 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 follow what. Uh, Kelvin proposes. Well, take, take. As a, this is a case, is a case stuff, is an exercise. And now take a psi to be defined. Of course, psi is a psi of x and y, as we had before, phi. And this psi is a, the inverse, tan minus 1, of a y over x. And let's compute. The psi dx, and if you compute the psi dn, dx, we have minus y, x squared plus y squared, and then the other, the uh, psi uh, y, and this is x, divided x squared minus, uh, plus y squared, and so the velocity field, uh, this gives a velocity field u in terms uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of this minus y, x squared plus y squared, x, uh, x squared plus y squared. Okay? This is the velocity field. 
Now you can check. Let me let me check. Actually, you can do it easily. You can check the properties of this U. So given given uh, sorry, time minus one of y over x, then uh, you have the u that uh, is uh, u is uh, solenoidal, 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 i.e., divergence of u equals zero. That means uh, incompressible. Is solenoidal and uh, U is also irrotation. Irrotation. I.e. curl of U equals zero. Okay, I will do it. Okay, so we have uh, that are incompressibility and irrotationality and uh, assuming. That the fluid is ideal, no viscosity. We are exactly in the same, in the uh, in the good uh, in the good situation. Uh, this means, uh, by the way, that because it is also so notable, it means that uh, uh, the Laplacian of psi is zero. So we deal with uh, harmonic psi is uh, harmonic in this domain of definition. Okay, remember, this is the, okay, you know what is this, the flash, etc. Um, right, so this is, this is the example. And he said, okay, I am in this situation, which works okay for my theory. My theory has uh, to deal with uh, the vortices in an ideal fluid, incompressible, and when I'm away from these vortices, the fluid is irritational, everything is okay. I can take this potential and work on it. So it goes back to basics, as uh, we learn from school. Always, also my advice, go to fundamentals. And then you may discover interesting things. So it goes to fundamentals. Imagine uh, that uh, we deal with this problem. And um, for this problem, we may consider now the following geometry, which is exactly what I did. Imagine that we have uh, our axis Z, and because of symmetry, the whole is here, 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 etc. Imagine that we have uh, a cylinder, uh, well, we may think infinitely extended. Well, we don't uh, need to go to infinity. We imagine, imagine that there are two radius, an internal radius R0 and an external radius R1, and there is a, a symmetry, axis of symmetry there, so that we can use, uh, for example, cylindrical coordinates to compute things and to work out things. And uh, so from first principle, from First, principles, uh, consider, uh, consider uh, the, uh, the divergence theorem, divergence of uh, U, this is Gauss theorem in the volume B, that can be reduced to U dS, where V is the volume of this uh, uh, whole cylinder and the uh, S here is just the surface, the boundary of V, boundary of uh, V uh, times the unit normal pointing upwards. Okay, so we have the surface here and the unit normal like this, new. Okay, so of course in the Z direction maybe it's infinitely long or something like this. And the volume being just the whole cylinder, the cylinder bore, bore by this, by this internal cylinder. Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, work out. 
Nice work out from the divergent theorem. Um, Green's uh, first identity in potential. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, to be slightly, slightly more general. More general. Think, okay, think of uh, U not only given by graph psi, as I wrote before, think of U given by two functions, phi and graph psi. Okay? You may think of phi equal to 1, and you are back to your problem. And uh, where, where, where phi. And uh, and psi are um, scalar scalar functions of the position of position. And uh, what we do, we apply Green's uh, theorem from from Green uh, first identity. We have, you know, we have Gauss here. We should replace U with this and work out what we get. Very simple. So we take this definition of U inside there and we have a volume integral. And then we take this inside there, we have a surface integral. Okay, so we have uh, the following uh, directly from there. Uh, directly from there, we have uh, the volume interval given by grad phi dot grad psi. I'm just uh, doing term by term plus uh, phi, and then we have the Laplacian of uh, psi. Remember the Laplacian of uh, uh, of uh, psi, and this is the contribution to the d, and. Uh, um, and then, and then on the other side, this side here, we have the integral of uh, what? The phi, and then I take uh, the direction of derivative along the nu of uh, psi in ds. Okay? Where, where this, uh, this uh, is just uh, um, the, uh, the grad operator, uh, how to write it? The grad, the grad operator times a new unit norm to the surface. Okay, so we can rewrite this. Let me, okay, let me rewrite. So this is just Green's first identity. That has to go to another blackboard. Let me rewrite this in two reports. Okay, uh, let, let's uh, rewrite the uh, same expression in two alternative, alternative uh, forms. One, okay, one, is uh, the integral of uh, grad phi dot grad psi in dv equal minus the integral over d, same volume, phi uh, Laplace of uh, psi dv plus uh, integral over s on uh, phi the uh, directional derivative of uh, psi in ds. The other form is uh, the following, is uh, the integral over the volume of uh, grad psi. Ah, uh, it's the same thing because it's a state of prop. But let me emphasize grad psi dot grad phi in dv, and this is equal to minus the integral of uh, psi uh, plus of uh, phi in dv plus uh, 
the integral over s of the psi, and then the directional derivative of the phi in es. Okay? Of course, this is equal to this. Hmm? I'm just perverse. Uh, the terms just to emphasize that now the role is placed or the attention is placed on uh, on uh, phi on psi rather than, than phi. Okay. Now assume for simplicity. Let's uh, let's assume. So first of all, one consideration is uh, well is on psi. Remember psi. I will rewrite. Uh, psi is taken to be the inner standard function of y over s. And uh, okay, that makes sense. You know, in polar coordinates, in polar coordinates, that coincides with the angle. Okay, with the say theta. Uh, if you see the first and second part, it's left hand side. Yeah, because uh, it's a scalar and if you change the disposition, so again it's a symmetric, it's symmetric. That's right. Yeah, but in, in, in the right hand side, the first term, actually the phi and then uh, del and uh, gradient and then psi. Yeah. So here the psi is operator. Right. So if we operate this uh, the the on, on the psi and then phi, so it's become equal. As it is, are because the, uh, pi and psi is two different functions, I think. If there are two different functions and we operate to a depth square, so probably the result will be different. So, how we can put equally? That's a, that's a good point. I, I get back to it, or try it immediately. So, I clarify what, what we are doing. So, first of all, let me remind you. That indeed the uh, psi by definition is satisfies our problem because it's a uh, irrotational solenoid, blah 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 blah. Uh, so it gives it, it gives the right velocity. It gives the right uh, velocity. But uh, but uh, it is multivalue. It is multivalue. So uh, the idea is uh, assuming. Assuming uh, phi for simplicity, for simplicity, is a single valued, is a single valued, and uh, um, and uh, uh, psi multi valued. What what we have? What we have. Okay, let's have a look. The first expression and the second expression. First expression. Uh, well, okay, psi multivalent, but graph psi is single valued. Okay, because it's up to a constant or something like this. When we take derivatives, that constant goes away. So this is okay. And here, well, here, this uh, eventually is zero, so this is okay. And uh, this, we take the graph of psi in some direction. So also in this case, everything is fine. So this uh, equality is perfectly satisfied. Kelvin wanted to work out, wanted to work out explicitly these terms for his case. So we will do that. We will do that. But it is clear immediately that uh, this is also okay. Because the graph of psi uh, removes uh, the arbitrariness uh, in psi. But here we have a problem because psi is multivalent. So we don't know this is exactly to what equal to. Is it equal to 0, to 5, to 10, to 15? We don't know. Psi is multivalent here and is multivalent here. So this equality doesn't. Doesn't uh, hold true in principle. 